Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 4. Once again, welcome to all of you that are watching online or maybe you're over in the venue. If you're here and you don't own a copy of the Word of God, just go into the altar room when we're done. We'll give you a free Bible. There's one over there in the venue. There's an altar room over there. Go. Uh, the elders of the church, once you gave your frankincense, your myrrh, and your gold, one of the things that they did was, hey, what if we just bought a whole lot of Bibles and we just give them away to people that don't have them? Other churches in our community that don't have them. Uh, we bought a whole bunch of Bibles for uh, a team that's going uh, with YWAM somewhere and bought Bibles in their language. And so a lot of those shekels go to just give Bibles to other churches in our community that don't have the resources we do, but who would like to give out uh, Bibles. Um, but today, all the verses, or just about all of them, are inside your program, except for the main text. There was so much of it that we didn't put it in there, uh, but you, you, it'll, it'll come up on the, on the jumbotrons. When I thought about going through the book of John, one of my titles that I was kind of working with was Conversations with the King. Because one of the things you find when you read through the Bible in the Old Testament, you see all these conversations that God has with his prophets. You get to the New Testament, especially the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're just loaded with conversations that Jesus has with different people. Um, the last time we were in our series in John, we were in John chapter 3, and we saw this great conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Remember? Nicodemus was a religious leader. He was a big shot, an important person in the community. He was, a, he was a somebody. He walked down the street. You knew who he was. He walked down the street, man. He had on the right clothes. You knew, man, that guy right there is a somebody. And now you get to John chapter 4, and there's another conversation, except this is with a nobody. In fact, we don't even know her name. All we know really about her is that she's lost, and she's just goofed up and with a lot of sin. But like the somebody, Nicodemus, Jesus will spend time with anybody. He spent a lot of time with the somebody. He spent a lot of time having a conversation with Nicodemus. And he's going to spend a lot of time having a conversation with a nobody. And that's the beautiful thing about the Lord. Doesn't matter where you're at. Doesn't matter whether you're a somebody or a nobody, so to speak. He longs to have a conversation with you. He longs to meet whatever needs you might have in, in, in your life. So let's read our text, okay? Uh, John chapter four, look at verse one. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. I'm talking about John the Baptist. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Verse 4 says he had to go through Samaria on the way. And I want you to underline that maybe in your Bibles. Verse 4. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob um, gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well, uh, beside the well uh, about noontime. And I want you to underline that phrase, tired from the long walk. Verse 7, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And you ought to underline verse 9. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I'd give you living water. 
But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Obviously, unlike Nicodemus, she had no clue who she's talking to. Nicodemus did. She has no clue. <laughs> Jesus replied in verse 13, anyone who drinks this water, the water from the well, will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And you ought to underline verse 13 and 14. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get this water. Now Jesus is going to change everything. Go and get your husband, Jesus said to her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. But you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you, you must be a prophet. Drop down to verse 27. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the vi village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciple, disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus said, I have a kind of food you know nothing about, guys. Did someone bring him food while they were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment, guys, comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Drop down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. And so he did. He stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Now here's what I'm gonna do very quickly. I'm gonna make five observations about this story. We had a gal who came who did a, basically a whole weekend for our gals on this one story. I, I got one sermon I'm gonna give. So this, these five observations uh, you know, aren't a comprehensive list of everything that's in here. They're just five observations that I wanna make with you today. And my prayer is, is that maybe one of them, not all five of them, but maybe one of them would somehow bounce around in your mind and the Holy Spirit that lives within you might use that one observation maybe to, I don't know, transform your life a little bit more like into the likeness of Jesus, okay? So here we go. Here's the first observation and it's deep. This one's deep. Ready? Here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. Jesus got tired Jesus got tired. Look at verse six. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired from the long walk. Some of your Bibles say tired as he was, right? Sat wearily beside the well about noontime. How many of you uh, have ever been, been tired? <laughs> some of you are tired right now, right? <laughs> I know some of you are. Some of you are sleeping. Let the guy sleep. Don't wake him up. Maybe that's what he needs right now. Beloved, here's the deal. If Jesus got tired, just hang with me here. What do 
are the chances you'll get tired? Hundred percent. Men, listen to me. There's nothing evil or sinful or wicked about getting tired. Jesus got tired. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit had no problem with John pinning those words that Jesus got tired. This isn't an indictment on Jesus' spirituality that he got tired. I'll guarantee you that every single person that's ever lived has gotten tired. Everybody gets tired. Nothing evil, as I said, with that. The issue is, is what do you do when you, when you get tired? Well, what did Jesus do when he got tired? This is brilliant, man. He got tired and so he sat down and rested. Oh, man. Whew. This is some deep theological stuff here. Unfortunately, a lot of guys in here don't get it. In fact, there are a lot of women in here going, oh, Lord, please. God, please speak to my husband right now. Because you don't get it, guys, some of you. You look at this story and we think that there's, you know, the deep truth is, is what happened at the well, but it's all the word of God, all of it. That was written for everyone, not just the conversation he's gonna have with the woman, but everything leading up to it. Someone once said, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do in a day is to take a nap. I'm now at that age where I, 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 look, I take a nap on Saturdays. Every Saturday I take a nap. I love naps. In fact, I'm looking forward to next Saturday already. It's, it's, it's Sunday and I'm already looking forward to next Saturday's nap, man. I, I love to take a nap. Uh, I'm now the guy that I used to mock. <laughs> Taking naps, man. Naps are for losers. People are dying and going to hell, man. We need to be about the Father's business. Only losers and sissies, man, they take naps. Jesus got tired. And he sits down because he was tired, he was weary, he's resting. You know, there's a huge difference between being tired and being burned out. A lot of times the reason you get burned out is because when you got tired, you didn't rest. <laughs> you didn't take a break. And you just kept going and going and going and going and going. And then you just found yourself just burned out. Mark chapter six records a great moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples. It says this in verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. So imagine this, the disciples show up and there's Jesus. Hey Jesus, we went to this house and we did this and we shared the gospel and then we walked to this town and we did this and we went here and we did that and did that and did that and Jesus is hearing it all. And what is Jesus' response to it all? Okay, guys, good, this day's over with. Here's tomorrow's plan, get on it. No, it's not what he says. He hears all the stuff that his disciples had done and then it says this, Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Wow. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Not, hey, let's get about the Father's business here, man. Time's short. No, hey guys, I've heard everything. Man, you walk to this house, you walk to this house, you walk this neighborhood, you, you, you walk to this town, you've been doing all kinds of stuff, all the conversations that you've had. Hey guys, look, before I weigh in, let's just go rest. Let's just go rest. It's beautiful. 
Look, nobody ever worked harder than Jesus did, but one of the things he did that kept him calm under pressure or whatever was that he rested. He made sure that his team rested. In fact, rest is so important to God that he put it in the Ten Commandments, didn't he? God said every seventh day you're to rest. Remember the Sabbath. That's not an option. God wants you to rest. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for us as human beings, for man's benefit, not the other way around. God knows that our physical and emotional and mental and spiritual constitution demands periodic breaks. Jesus rested. Some of you need to leave here today and, and make plans that you'll take one day off a week and just rest. Just be like Jesus. Honor the word of God and rest. The wisest man that ever lived said this in Ecclesiastes chapter three, there, there's a time for everything and everything on earth has its special season. In other words, this is beautiful rhythm to life, or let me use the word balance, if you will. There's a balance to this thing called life. There's a time to work, and God wants us to work, men, and there's a time to rest. There's a time to strive and grow your business, or whatever that might be, and there's a time to just enjoy your family, or whatever it might be. Listen, if you somehow, your life is basically revolves around your work. You know, you wake up every day, you work 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I want you to know, that there's a number of things I know about you. Let me give you five. Number one, you have no clue who you are. You don't know about your identity in Christ. If you're working seven days a week, just gutting it out. Number two, you have no clue who you serve. You have no clue who the king is because the king would never want you working like that. Number three, you're not spending any time in prayer. Don't, don't tell me you work seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day, but oh, you know, pastor, I pray because that's a lie. Because if you were praying, then I know the Lord would tell you to obey his word and rest. Number four, your family's getting ripped off because they never get to see you or they just kind of get the crumbs of your life. And number five, you're never going to experience this rich and satisfying life that Jesus came to give you that he talks about in John chapter 10. Now this rich and satisfying life obviously is going to be fulfilled when we get to glory, but there's an element of it down here that he wants his people to experience. Observation number two. Jesus always did his Father's will. The only thing that mattered to Jesus was his Father's will. That's it. Look at verse four. It says he had to go through Samaria on the way. Now what does that mean? I got, I got a map, put that map up here. I, I wanna show you what, it, what it, this is what Israel looks like, okay? So this is Israel, okay? Jesus, where the story is, begins down here. He's down here in Judea. You see that? He's down in this area here. Okay? He's going up to the Galilee area. He's going up there. That's where he's headed. Right? But he's down here. There were two ways you could get, there were more than two, but two primary ways to get from Judea up to the Galilee area. You could take the 99 and go up this way, the red line, okay? That's the road that Jesus took because look, there's the city of Sychar right there. That's where he's at. But Jews never took that route because the Jews and the Samaritans never, didn't get along. And I don't have time to tell you why they didn't get along. That's some of your homework. You can do that on your own. But the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't mix. And so a Jew would never take the 99. 
A Jew would always take the I-5. Okay. The Jew would take the blue route. They'd go up through Jericho and make their way up that way. They, they'd kind of go the long way. That way they never had to go through Samaria. You see it? But the Bible says that he had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. He, he could have gone this way. So why does it say he had to go this way? <laughs> because he always did what the Father wanted him to do. That's why he had to go that way. The Father had communicated to him, look, I want you to go to Galilee. That's where I want you to go. And this is the direction I want you to go because I got a divine appointment for you. I got a gal that you're going to meet up with. I got a city of people who need me. And so Jesus says he had to go this way. Why? Because the father told him he had to go this way. That's why. Jesus always did the will of his father. Look at uh, verse 31 of our text. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, you need to eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did, did someone go down to, you know, Subway and pick up some footlongs? Did, did someone go pick up some food and give it to Jesus? Then Jesus explained, guys, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and finishing his work. Guys, listen, you're all caught up in physical food, man. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what just gets me pumped. Let me tell you what, what gives me the juice that I need. It's when I do what God the Father wants me to do. That's the food that I need. That's the food that energizes me. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter four, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, we, we don't live on pizzas and that kind of, oh, our physical bodies need those, but what we live on is the will of God every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See? Now the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter five that we're to imitate God, right? The Bible says, imitate God therefore in everything you do because you are his dear children. We are called as his followers to imitate Christ. And one of the things that we know is that Jesus always did the will of his father. So one of the distinguishing marks for us is that we have to also be committed to doing the will of the Father. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter six, seek first God's kingdom and what he wants. That's the first thing that we're to do, is we're to seek God's will, God's kingdom. This is to be front and center to the life of a believer, the scriptures, his word. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. So Mary's outside the house and probably James and Jude, some of his half brothers are all out there. And it says, uh, hey, uh, uh, someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are out standing outside and they wanna speak to you. And Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who, who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and he said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Boy, that's a great descriptor, isn't it, of what a follower of Christ is? That's a great descriptor of, uh, descriptor of what two brothers in the Lord or two sisters in the Lord or a brother and sister in the Lord are. Hey, look. You can tell me you're my brother in the Lord. You can tell me you're my sister in the Lord. 
And that may be true, may not be true, but how I will know that you're my brother in the Lord, how I will know you're my sister in the Lord is that you will have a heart to do the will of God. That's how I'll know. Someone once said, the word of God is the will of God. And that's true. This is the will of God, this right here. And Jesus was committed to always doing what his father wanted. And we, his followers, need to also be committed. Observation number three. Jesus wasn't afraid to go to unpopular places and talk with unpopular people. Verse nine says this. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. Look at verse 27. Then, uh, just then, the, his disciples came back and they were shocked. Why? Because he was talking to a woman. In that culture, men, you know, just didn't talk with women, especially a strange man who had never met this woman before. That was a cultural no-no. What we're reading here in John chapter four was really radical. A, that he would go up through Samaria. That was an unpopular place. A modern day context might be this. He was willing to go to the other side of the tracks. And he's having a conversation with somebody who, um, you just didn't do that. As I said earlier, the, the Samaritans and the Jews just didn't get along, it was ugly. But here we have Jesus obeying the Father, going right through the heart of a very unpopular place. And then he meets up with a very unpopular person. Let me just tell you this, and I wish I had more time to go into this. Jacob's well was outside the city. There was another well inside the city. She could have gone to that well, but she didn't. She's gonna make a long journey out to a well. She's all by herself. And you know why she makes that long journey? because she probably wasn't very well liked. They didn't want her at that inner well, and so she had to make this long journey out to get her water. She was an unpopular person, there's no doubt in my mind. No doubt in my mind. And here's the king, the one that we're to imitate, in this unpopular place, talking with a very unpopular person. This got me um, thinking about some of our global partners, and I was thinking about the Grovers who were in Tanzania, young couple. And there was this moment in their life not long ago where they were down in Judea, so to speak, and they were supposed to go to the Galilee. And they had two roads they could take. They could stay right here in America and with their family and all of that and be around, you know, us and cool people or they go another route and go meet up with some unpopular people. In fact, this is a people group, you couldn't even find it on a map, most of you, if you were to look. And they're meeting and trying to reach unpopular people. I was thinking about Steve and Diane Warren, wow. Basically their whole lives in Africa, they went to this very unpopular place and they worked like crazy to reach a very unpopular group of people, children. I was thinking about some of our, our local partners. I was thinking about the church at the park and Dean Dodd and man, there's a guy who goes to an unpopular part of our city and he's reaching some very unpopular people and I'm glad that a number of you volunteer and you help. I'm glad that our church helps out uh, financially and all of that because what a great ministry. I was thinking about um, the gospel mission. It's in an unpopular part of our town and they are touching the lives of some very unpopular people, right? The homeless. I was thinking about the Vine House, you know, the Van Horns normally sit right down here. Talk about an unpopular place, Vine Avenue, and they're reaching some really unpopular people. God's doing some great things through them. 
I was thinking about the Modesto Pregnancy Center, Chrissy, who oversees it, so now she's right back there on Saturday night. And she's certainly meeting with some unpopular people, these young gals that come in and, and they're pregnant. Yeah, they've, they've blown it and they've sinned and there's all this stuff, but they got a life inside of them. And here they are doing their best to love and care for somebody that's not real popular. All these folks remind me a lot of Jesus. Is there some place you're supposed to go? You have some, somebody you're supposed to reach, but they're not very popular? Is there a particular part of our city you've never gone to, but maybe God wants you to go there and volunteer? Is there somebody that, you know what, man, if somebody sees me with that person, it's not gonna look good. Maybe you're red and they're blue. And the last thing you want is for somebody to see you sitting down and having breakfast with somebody of another political stripe. What would they think of you? But that person needs Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the one observation that God will use in your life. How about this one? Observation number four. Jesus is the only person that can bring real and lasting satisfaction uh, to your life. Look at verse 13. Jesus replied, anybody who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. And he's got this great illustration going. He's saying to this woman, hey, listen, you, you, you drink this water? Ah, wow, that's good. It'll give you some satisfaction for a while. I won't be thirsty again for a while. But there's gonna come a moment where I'm gonna need another bottle of water. I'll be thirsty again. I had breakfast this morning. Woo, satisfied me. By the time I get home today, I won't be satisfied anymore. And then I'll eat lunch and I'll be satisfied. And then about dinner time, oh man, I'm not satisfied. Jesus says, hey, look, lady, that, that water right there, you'll be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never thirst again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. I want you to think about this woman for a, a moment. She was married five times and divorced five times. I'm sure she had many kids. So those kids all had different dads, stepdads, men coming in and out of the house. I mean, this wasn't just a woman who got married and that was it. Especially in that culture, I'm sure she had children. I mean, this was a mess. This was a bloody mess. And the first time she got married, I, I'm sure like most of you who have been married and divorced, wow, you wanted a man in your life, you wanted a woman in your life, because this story could work either way. And you met that man, and man, there was some satisfaction. You met that woman, there was some satisfaction, and it was really great. It was like taking a drink of water, but then there came a moment when something happened, and it was no good, a divorce happened. And then, man, I, I gotta have another man. I gotta have a man in my life. I gotta have a woman in my life. And you get married again. Make more babies with that man, that woman. And that gives you some satisfaction for a while. Yeah, I got somebody in my life, somebody I can lay next to, whatever. And then, you know, that, that wears off and the person leaves. And I, I, got, I got to find another man. I got to find another woman. And you get married again. That goes on five times. Maybe after the fifth one, she thinks to herself, look, man, I just need a dude in my life. So I'm not even going to marry this one. This gal was obviously looking for something. And it could be a guy. We, 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 can, we can just look for things to bring us satisfaction. And like water, in this case it was the well or, or food, these things can bring us satisfaction for a season. And then we get thirsty again or we get hungry again or whatever it is. And Jesus comes along and says, Lady, look, you give your life to me. I mean, really sell out to me? Really? You make my will your will? Whew. Let me tell you something. It'll, it'll revolutionize your life. Oh, you're still going to get physically thirsty. You're still going to get physically hungry. But wow, there'll be a satisfaction in your soul that will... Go on forever and ever and, and ever.
Let, 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 let me do this last observation about the woman here, okay? This woman wasn't afraid to tell others uh, about Jesus. Um, she has this encounter, this conversation, and she's blown away. And she goes back into town and she begins to tell the people in the town about Jesus. And she begins to invite people out to see Jesus. And so all these people are making their way out to the well. And so all these people now are out there hearing about Christ. Jesus is meeting them. Jesus is having more conversations. People are coming to faith in Christ. She wasn't afraid to go tell people about Jesus. She understood the importance of Jesus's presence in her life. And here's the interesting thing. The disciples went into town too, didn't they? How many people did the disciples bring out to see Jesus? Eh! They just came back with a bunch of sandwiches. Not a one of them goes into town and says, hey listen, it's kind of weird that us Jews would go through Samaria, but you're fortunate today because the Messiah is right out there at Jacob's well. You could come out there and you could meet the very one who could forgive you of your sins. You could, I, man, I've seen this guy do miracles. I, I've seen this guy preach, man. Not one of those dudes brought one person out to meet Jesus. But this sinful woman, <laughs> that's a great thing about the story. Been married five times, living with a dude. Been a mess of her life. What does she do? It's weird how when somebody who's really broken and they really understand their brokenness and they understand that Jesus is the only one who can fix them up, they're the ones who are the greatest evangelists on the planet. They get it. And she goes back into town and she doesn't care whether people think she's weird or nuts or, hey, there's that gal who's married five times living with some dudes. And they, 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 she doesn't care. All she knows is that these are people who need Christ. They need the Messiah. Hey guys, you gotta come. You gotta meet this guy. And the neat thing is, is that people listen to her. I don't know if it was the inflection in her voice. I don't know if it was her countenance. I don't know what it was that made these people go, hey look, she's weird, but there's something going down in her life. Something's happening. Let's go out and check this guy out. And they go out and man, whole revival breaks out. Who's the, who's the person you need to share your faith with? Hey, forget about going to an unpopular place and talking to unpopular people. Forget that for a moment. When was the last time you just went to a popular place and talked with cool people, popular people, people that look like you, talk like you, maybe you work in the same place, you do life together, you play golf together, you play tennis together, you're in a book club together, you're in the garden club together. They're cool people, right? You're cool, I mean, you're in the same clubs as they are. When was the last time you, like this woman, said, hey, listen, I gotta tell you about Jesus. I, I think he's the Messiah. I'm learning about him. Well, why don't you come? Listen to my pastor preach. Come to our women's Bible studies. Hey, come to our men's Bible study, man. I, I don't know. I'm not really sure what it's all about. I've made a mess of my life, as you well know, right? And, and come on. I, I think God's doing something in my life. Would you come? Would you check him out? Now what's interesting is, in the story, is a whole lot of people actually go out to the well, right? But a whole lot of people didn't. Jesus stays in the city for two days. And it was during that time, some people said, no, nah, I ain't going out to that well. I'm not going to your church. I'm not going to your Easter service. I'm not going to your Christmas service. I don't want to go there. And they don't go out to the well. 
But the woman doesn't give up, does she? Because we read where later on, more people started coming. And that's kind of the way evangelism works. You share your faith with somebody, they may blow you off, but you don't give up. It might be the next day. It may be two days later. It may be a week later. It may be like my dad 20 years later. You don't give up. You keep praying for your friends and talking about Christ the Messiah with your friends. You keep inviting them to things. You, but boy, don't give up. Not everybody went out to the well that day to hear the story of Jesus. Some, for some, it took a couple of days. It may take time. So these observations that I've made, the first one was, you know, Jesus got tired. Hey, we're going to get tired. Let, let, let's, let's rest, okay? It's good to rest. Nothing wrong with resting. Some of you need a good rest. Some of you need a good nap. Nothing wrong with that. The second observation is that Jesus always did his Father's will. For some of you, you know the Lord, but frankly, you know, there are some things you're, 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 you've decided, I'm not gonna live out what the Bible says in that area. You're living out a lot of what the will of God is. I think it's the Lord's will that you're in church. So obviously you're living it out, right? But there are certain areas where you just go, man, I don't know, man, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you walk out of here today going, you know what, I need to be like Jesus. I need to live out the will of God as best I can. Jesus wasn't afraid to go to unpopular places and talk with unpopular people. Maybe the decision you make today is going, man, I gotta change my attitude towards some of the people I run into in this city. I gotta change my attitude about maybe some of the places in my city where I just frankly won't go. And maybe, maybe, maybe some of you, you're supposed to work at the gospel mission. You're supposed to work at the vine house. You're supposed to go help out with church in the park. Go, go to unpopular places. One of the things I love about the forest is that was their whole ministry. They went to unpopular places in our city, under bridges. Well, I don't know when the last time I've been under a bridge been a long time. Damn, that's where they go. And there's people under there and maybe they've gotten themselves into trouble and it's their own fault, like this woman at the well, but they still need the Lord, don't they? Jesus is the only person that can bring real and lasting satisfaction to your life. Maybe you've been looking for satisfaction in all different kinds of places and today you go, you know what, I just need to sell out to Christ. I've told the story before in our old neighborhood in Veranda. I remember once uh, my daughter had some, you know, the bubbles that, you know, the soap bubbles that blow, and I was reminded of this on our vacation because they had these big bubbles this guy was blowing, and I watched this little kid run and chase down these bubbles, and he'd grab them and run back. Dad, Dad, look at this, and he'd open his hand, there wouldn't be any air, you know. And then the guy would blow these big bubbles, and this little kid would run, and the wind would take it, and he'd finally grab a bubble and run back to his mom. Woo, woo, and he'd open his hand, nothing there. That's what a lot of Christians do. They reach out for these bubbles and they think they got something. Woohoo! Woo! And then there comes a moment they open their hands, right? That man didn't satisfy me. That woman didn't satisfy me. I got another man. Yes. And there comes a moment when these things we reach out to are nothing but bubbles. We think we got something until we open our hands. And maybe you walk out of here saying, you know what? I got me a good woman, I got me a good man, I got me a good job, I got me a good, whatever it is, but I'm gonna let Jesus be the one who satisfies me. That might be a good decision. And then 
We looked at this, the fact that this woman wasn't afraid to tell others about Jesus. And maybe that's the thing you walk out of here with, that man, I gotta be a little bit more vocal about my faith and the Lord. Why don't you stand over in the venue, why don't you stand and let me pray. So Lord, thank you God for your goodness to us as a church family. Every single one of us who knows you was exactly like that woman at the well. We were lost. We may not have been married five times and, and been living with people, but we had our own sin. We were broken just like she was. And there came a moment with, when like this woman, you had a conversation with us and you opened our eyes to the truth. Thank you, Lord, for talking with people. The wealthy and powerful like Nicodemus and the nothings of life like this woman at a well. You love all people. Father, thanks for your goodness. And I pray this in your name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, live for Jesus Christ, okay?